Thanks for tuning in to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. We've been talking about micronutrients off and on here this fall, and I got questions about this. You know, you got micronutrients. Are there some super duper micronutrients that we only need just a tiny little bit about that we should be aware of? <laughs> yes, there are. We're going to talk about them today. All right, as we get near the end of the year, we always get these questions about prepaying. Should a farmer prepay for expenses? We want to talk through some of the advantages and disadvantages with you today. Of course, we'll have a weed of the week to fight, and this week's weed will be a fun one. We'll show you what will get it under control on your farm. First, here's this week's Farm Basics. The last thing you want after harvesting your grain is to spoil it before it goes to market. The Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG is a low-cost bin monitoring solution that tracks temperature and humidity and alerts you when conditions exceed safe thresholds. Visit farmshopmfg.com. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little bit about how much water does a crop actually use. And I actually ran some calculations, so I, I, I just wrote them down because I knew I wouldn't be able to remember all this. It's just, always scary to me. Example. Whenever Brian comes to the field with papers <laughs> in his hand, I'm like, oh no, what's it going to be this time? But you think about it, there are a lot of different crops that we're growing. and. Rainfall doesn't exactly come the same amount every day unless you're well, doing Well, we're going to talk about all that, but uh, uh, here's the thing. I just want to give you some numbers to start with. Let's say that I've got 100 bushel corn versus 300 bushel corn, and let's say I was able to raise each miraculously on the exact same amount of water, which is sometimes possible. So in our area, our average rainfall is 22 inches for the entire year that includes the snow. An acre inch of water is 27,154 gallons. So if you multiply the 22 inches times the 27,154, that comes up to 597,388 gallons. We'll call it 600,000 gallons for short. All right, if you divide that out by 100 bushels versus 300 bushels, here's what it amounts to. The 100 bushels took 5,974 gallons. The 300 bushel corn took 1,991 bushels. Now, the reason why I wanted to start you with this is to say both things are possible, and we want to talk today about how both things can be possible that, look, it took 6,000 gallons of water in one case versus 2,000 gallons of water per bushel in another case. All right, well, here's the easy way to look at this, Brian. Let's just say you put that corn plant in a pot. How many gallons of water is it going to take? Not very many for the whole year. It's certainly not going to take 2,000 gallons to raise an acre worth of corn or 6,000 gallons. A lot of that water is either going to run off or soak down through the ground. So it's not going to matter. We can do it on less gallons, there's no question. But my idea, Brian, is how do we capture more of that water with a bigger root system? Could we get 1,000 bushel corn if we could do that? All right, well, there's that. But what I want you to think about to begin with is how many plants are actually out there on a per acre basis. Some farmers will plant as much as 40,000 plants on a per acre basis. Other farmers might plant 12,000 or 16,000 plants. So that will have something to do with it. Another big thing is plants have the process of respiration and transpiration. They're constantly kicking water out into the air, pulling water back in from the air. There's below ground water movement. Darren mentioned already earlier, there's the timing on the rainfall. There's capillary action of water in soil where literally it can move up in the soil. Every soil is a little different in terms of water holding capacity. And then there is certainly temperature and humidity. There are a lot of factors that enter into this. Well, certainly when we're talking about any kind of plant, it's going to take some moisture. Maybe a cactus doesn't take much, but it does need a little bit of moisture. Crops may need quite a bit more than a cactus, but they still don't need all the moisture that we're using for the bushels that we're currently raising. We can raise more bushels per gallon of water. That's one of the big things that farmers are working for going forward. So one of the things that farmers can do to make this better is by having the proper balance of nutrients out there. Crops become water wasters when they're short on any one nutrient. So if they're short on some nutrient, they start pulling more water in because that's how the nutrient gets into the plant is by bringing water in. So we can make our plants more efficient if we just do a better job overall in terms of fertility out there. But the big thing, and the reason why we wanted to talk about this today is there is no exact answer. People will say, how much water does it take to produce a bushel of corn or a bushel of soybeans or anything? Nobody knows. It can vary a tremendous amount. But our goal as farmers is to continue to use less, yet produce more. 
Well, we can certainly get by with less gallons of water if we don't have any weeds in our field. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed later in the show. In 1949, Morton Buildings constructed our first machine storage building to establish our bond with the farming community. Since then, our relationship has grown and so have our product offerings. From the smallest specialized operation to the largest agricultural enterprise, we understand the needs of your business and continue to evolve to meet industry demands. Plus, when you build a Morton building, you're backed by the strongest warranty in the business. To learn more about the Morton Advantage, visit mortonbuildings.com. The Guardian Air Twin Spray Nozzle from Hypro produces a twin spray pattern with air inducted droplets for superior coverage, even in dense canopies. Be effective and efficient with your spray application this season with the Guardian Air Twin. Hypro, helping you spray better. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all around grain handling solution. Our conveyor based system uses an 18 inch belt and a 10 inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. There are a lot of steps to having a perfect season. Don't let your fertilizer plan be the step that trips you up. No matter when you apply fertilizer, no matter how, AgroLiquid has the experts and the products that'll help you move closer to your target and hit the bullseye. AgroLiquid moves you closer to your target. More choices, more money. With Bayer Plus Rewards, you choose from our broad portfolio of high-performance products. Earn more money on the eligible products that are right for your farm. And use our new portal to see your purchases, track your rewards, and decide how you want to use them. Visit MyBayerPlus.com to sign in and start earning. That's the advantage of more control in your hands. That's the plus. So we got the old Delta downforce, precision speed tubes, working our magic for planting nine, nine, nine and a half mile an hour. And like with my other planter, to get what I wanted, you know, we were at that four mile an hour. And, and I will bet you this planter here at nine and a half, ten mile an hour is planting more accurate than my old planter was at four and a half. That's saying something. Over the last couple of months, we've been talking about a lot of different nutrients that are super important in plants. Everything from the major nutrients, N, P, and K, all the way down to the micronutrients, including things that you have probably heard of and maybe even fertilized with on your farm, like zinc, boron, copper, manganese, and iron. Well, today we want to talk about three nutrients that you have hardly ever heard of before, may never have fertilized with, but we want to talk about the importance of them in your crop. So it's molybdenum, cobalt, and nickel. Let's start by talking about molybdenum. This is one that's gotten a little bit of attention now the last few years in agriculture. Certainly even 20 years back there was some talk about molybdenum, although not a whole lot of use in most of the United States. But molybdenum is one that's starting to get more play in soybeans and legume type crops. What we see with molybdenum is the availability in soils is a little better if the pH is 6.3 or above. So there are many farmers that need to lime acres and one of the reasons they're liming is they're seeing a little more molly show up. Unfortunately, not many people are testing for molybdenum. It seems to be one of those nutrients, as are the others that we'll be talking about today, that you really need to request to be on that soil test or you're not going to see it. Now with molybdenum in alfalfa, it's often responsible for leaf drop. If you see a lot of leaf drop in alfalfa, it's because it could be because molybdenum is low. And in other crops, molybdenum is very important taking nitrogen and converting it into amino acids. So if you want to help that nitrogen process along, this is certainly a nutrient that has a big influence on how nitrogen is utilized in the plant. All right, I wanna talk a little about nickel. Now, the only reason you have probably ever heard of nickel is what? For the U.S. nickel. Okay, well, how much nickel is actually in the nickel anymore? I don't think it's that much. But anyway, talking about crops, 
it was only a little over 20 years ago that it was recognized that nickel is actually a nutrient that is important in crops. Prior to that, what we often thought of with nickel is it's just considered a heavy metal, kind of like chromium or cadmium or, I mean, there are a bunch of these heavy metals that you say, you know what, if I get some water treatment live, or let's say that I get some municipal waste, I want to have that tested and make sure that my levels of heavy metals aren't so high that it actually hurts my soil. So Darren mentioned molybdenum already. That's also considered a heavy metal. Molybdenum and nickel, the EPA has guidelines that you cannot exceed for applying to your soil. Now, I'm not too worried about that for this whole conversation here because the plant only needs a minuscule amount, just a tiny amount of nickel each year. It might already have enough, but now we are finding some fertilizer products are made with a little bit of nickel in. Even on our farm, for example, the micro blend that we are using at planting time on both our corn and soybeans contains a very, very trace amount of nickel. We're also using a little bit of this foliar, and we do have some farmers that are seeing some response to this. All right, so what is nickel important for? Well, it's important for a number of different functions in the plant, but there are a couple I'll mention specifically. A little bit like molybdenum, it's important for nodulation in plants in some of those legumes. It also is important for how nitrogen gets utilized in the plant. So I'm not saying if, oh, you had a big nitrogen shortage in your corn, that the whole answer is nickel. But what I am saying is that could be a very small component of it and something you may want to consider looking at on your farm. Now, in terms of testing for this, there aren't a lot of tests that are commonly run out there for nickel, so you'd have to specially request either a soil test or a plant tissue analysis test. Well, the last nutrient we want to talk about today here, Brian, is cobalt. And when I went to college, I also took animal science classes and looked at balancing rations, looked at pasture health and all these things. And one of the things that I heard was, well, you need to know how much cobalt you have out in that pasture because it's going to be important for livestock health. That's about the only time I've heard about cobalt, Brian, is livestock health. You want to have a tiny little bit out there. So we've done a little bit of testing on our farm looking at just that. And guess what? If you're not testing for cobalt, if you're never applying cobalt, you may be running short. So do, again, test for this nutrient occasionally, especially if you have livestock and you're going to be taking pasture or hay or feedstuffs to that livestock. So with our discussion today, we just want to make sure that we're very clear here. There are a lot of things that are more important than molybdenum, cobalt, or nickel for your crop. So definitely take a look at your pH, look at your N, P, and K, look at your sulfur, some of your micronutrients, all that stuff you've got to analyze first. But if you get to the point where you go, you know what, my yields are pretty good. I got a lot of these things fixed on my farm. I'm looking for what's the next thing I could be trying. We would encourage you to try some very low rates of these fertilizer products and certainly run some tests. You don't have to spend a lot of money or do it on a lot of acres to begin with, but until you start testing, until you start just trying a little bit on your farm, you're never gonna know if molybdenum, nickel, or cobalt could actually help your yields. Well, one thing that I know will help your yields is controlling our Weed of the Week. We'll talk about control methods later in the show. Tough, precise, efficient. Strip tillage with the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm. Learn more at SoilWarrior.com slash AgPhD. There are a lot of steps to having a perfect season. Don't let your fertilizer plant be the step that trips you up. No matter when you apply fertilizer, no matter how, AgroLiquid has the experts and the products that'll help you move closer to your target and hit the bullseye. Agroliquid moves you closer to your target. It's no secret that Mother Nature doesn't always cooperate with your schedule. Field conditions in recent years kept many from timely planting and fertilizing. And when you can't get your fertilizer applied, you lose thousands of dollars in yield potential. If you need flexibility in your fertility application timing, you need a drop tube system from CNR Supply. CNR drop tubes allow you to apply liquid nitrogen in season and place it exactly where your crop needs it. 
To learn more about low-cost CNR drop tube solutions, visit crsupply.com. I need results, so I choose the one system I trust to take weeds down and keep them down on even my toughest acres with the kind of yield potential that helps keep me in the black to deliver my kind of results season after season. I choose the Roundup Ready Extend Crop System. I choose results. It's been remarkable what we've seen out of the varieties of Extend soybeans, the yield has come through for us. We had the best soybean crop we've ever had. The yields were there. With the Roundup Ready Extend crop system, the yield boost and the lack of weed pressure really helps our bottom line. The technology has exceeded my expectations. It's one thing that the industry has been looking for for years. There's nothing like harvesting record crops. Growing up on the farm, one of the things our dad always told us was, you got to make money with your back and with your brain. Now, unfortunately, when Darren and I were on the farm, we had to make our money with our backs all the time when we were kids. But at least dad told us about how he made money with his brain. And one of the ways he did that was prepaying expenses. So there are two main things we wanted to talk about today in terms of advantages, and we'll get to some disadvantages as well. But the main advantages have to do with tax reasons and then just flat out getting a better price by paying early. One thing about farming is there is a lot of certainties. I certainly know I will be using seed next year. I will be planting some corn and I will be planting some soybeans, at least on my ground. So if I can buy the seed that I'm going to need in September, October, December, January, before I need it in April or May and get a huge discount, I'm all in. I'm going to buy it anyway. And I look at if I had money in the bank, what am I earning on that money in the bank? Virtually nothing. So honestly, it probably wouldn't take that huge an incentive for me to buy my stuff early. But fortunately, many seed companies and crop protection companies have some pretty large discounts for buying early. When it comes to the tax thing, it all depends on when is your tax year. So for most farmers, it's the calendar year. So December 31 is a really, really big date. The advantage that farmers have been given by the government is here in the United States, we are able to use cash accounting. And basically what that means is if we have expenses, we can immediately deduct those from the money we earn. So let's say, for example, we were going to earn $50,000 and we write a check out to buy more seed for $10,000. Well, we lower that $50,000 by 10 and we get down to $40,000 and that's what we pay income tax on. That's awesome. Now, if you're a non-farmer and you hear this, you go, wait a second, how does the farmer get by not having to pay tax? Whoa, whoa, whoa. The farmer still has to pay tax, all right? All it ends up being is a delayed tax bill. So instead of paying the tax this year, you just have to pay the tax next year. The reason why the government allows this is, well, a couple of things. For one, farm income can be way up one year, way down the next year. So it's a little bit of a way for a farmer to income average instead of using the actual income averaging thing that the government does allow for many different industries. The other thing is, in order to get this tax delay, the farmer has to spend the money now, spend the physical cash now. Well, when that cash gets spent, that turns many times in the economy, the economy gets going faster, and everybody's happy. That's all fine and dandy, Brian. It's, it's nice to save some money, and yeah, it's nice to help out on taxes if you can, and stimulate the economy at the same time. Those are wonderful things. However, if you're going to prepay, you have to make sure your money is safe because you're putting it out now when, like in my case, I'm putting it out now for seed that I don't really need until spring and I probably might not even be taking it all on my farm just because if it's bulk seed that's going to get treated later or hasn't even been cleaned yet or something like that, I may not even be able to get it yet. So what we encourage you to do, if you're worried about your money, then take the product immediately. Otherwise, 
find somebody else where you can put the money and you feel much safer. It's a really big deal because what collateral do you really have? In most cases, farmers have zero collateral, so you have to be concerned about that. The other big thing that I look at as a disadvantage is, what if your plans change? What if you need to switch from seed to chemistry or you change from corn to beans? What happens, worst case scenario, if you have prevent plant acres like you did in 2019? That can be a real problem. So I, I would encourage you, talk to your retailer and ask all these questions before you write the check. Before you write the check, you have the power. For example, at a lot of retailers, they won't give you your money back when you prepay them. You have to use it up in product. Well, some retailers, you can get the money back right away and you can get interest on your money. So take a look at that. And if you have any concerns, there are lots of retailers out there, lots of people that you can talk to and get the terms that you are looking for. Well, there certainly are some advantages and some potential disadvantages to prepaying. Make sure you do your homework and check these things out first before you write that check. One other thing you'll definitely want to learn about ahead of time is our Weed of the Week. We'll share what we know coming up right after this. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher with unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift and near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> Weed of the Week is a tough annual vine. It's Ivy Leaf Morning Glory. Oh boy, when we talk about vines, Brian, it's, it's just so critical to get a pre-emerge herbicide out there because once these types of plants start vining out, think about that. If you're just trying to get coverage on a little weed, that's one thing, but when that weed can vine out and spread underneath your crop canopy and wrap around uh, it, it's, it's really tough to get. So get after it early with your pre-emerge herbicide, but also with your post. Don't wait. Don't wait till that corn's big. If you got vines like Ivy Leaf Morning Glory, get going. Well, corn, beans, any crop that we're talking about. And here's the challenge. We have resistance issues or I shouldn't even necessarily say resistance, at least tolerance. Roundup has never been that great. The HVPDs have never been that great. So you've got to be at least a little more particular about what you're going to use for Ivy Leaf Morning Glory. All right, let's talk about control methods. And we'll start with soybeans. Use the three pre-program that we often talk about using one of the PPOs, Authority or Valor, plus Metribuzin, plus one of the yellows like Trifluralin or Pro. Okay, post-emerge in soybeans, things have gotten a lot easier. Now that we have Enlist, we have Extend, we have Liberty Link, all those traits or the herbicides you can use over the top of those traits can be pretty effective. Other than, like we said earlier, Roundup is not the best. But I'll tell you what, you put Roundup together with that Cambo or Roundup together with 2,4-D, it's like a whole different product. In corn, I like Verdict down, but you could also use Triple Flex or Sure Start. In many cases, those are a little bit cheaper. Post-emerge, my favorite product to use on Ivy Leaf Morning Glory would be Status. All right, in wheat, I would start with Sharpen, follow post-emerge with something like Wide Match, and then throw a little bit of Affinity in there as well. Now, certainly you could throw some 2,4-D out. We just don't like 2,4-D on wheat. We think it's a little bit hard on the wheat. Oh, and I should also mention the HPPD chemistry is not good on this weed. So that's why we didn't say Husky, even though there is some bromoxanil in there. The HPPD component's not really good on Ivy Leaf Morning Glory. And on the corn side, there are a lot of HPPD products that are pretty cheap, but they're not very effective on Ivy Leaf Morning Glory. Yep, so that's why we were saying you just have to be a little bit more selective on your herbicide choices. I know the HPPDs are great, and I know Roundup is great on a lot of weeds, but neither of those are very good on Ivy Leaf Morning Glory. That's all the time we have for this week's Weed, but Iron Talk is coming up next. More choices, more money. With Bayer Plus Rewards, you choose from our broad portfolio of high-performance products. Earn more money on the eligible products that are right for your farm. And use our new portal to see your purchases, track your rewards, 
and decide how you want to use them. Visit MyBayerPlus.com to sign in and start earning. That's the advantage of more control in your hands. That's the plus. It's no secret that Mother Nature doesn't always cooperate with your schedule. Field conditions in recent years kept many from timely planting and fertilizing. And when you can't get your fertilizer applied, you lose thousands of dollars in yield potential. If you need flexibility in your fertility application timing, you need a drop tube system from CNR Supply. CNR drop tubes allow you to apply liquid nitrogen in season and place it exactly where your crop needs it. To learn more about low-cost CNR drop tube solutions, visit crsupply.com. Do you feel like there's never enough time to get everything done before planting? The window for spring work is quick and unforgiving. Give yourself the upper hand with the ProTail High Performance High Speed Disc. More and more farmers agree the ProTail is the right tool for spring field conditions and heavy residue management. Zero maintenance bearings, independent disc technology, oversized pins and bushings allow the ProTail to handle whatever field or conditions you can throw at it. Degelman High Performance Equipment. It was here on this farm. We had that big crop set a personal best. And I like to say, you know, don't worry about those big goals. Just continue to set a personal best or farm best. And, you know, just keep taking those little steps. So 2019, I just want to set a personal best yield for us. That would be exciting. You work hard and invest a lot of time and money to make your crop each year. Don't let that effort go to waste. Moisture loss from over drying stored grain can cost you thousands for each percentage point lost. Get the Grain Temp Guard Alarm HT from FarmShop MFG. The Alarm HT uses temperature and humidity sensors to alert you when conditions in your bin put your crop at risk. Don't shrink your profits. Learn more about this low cost solution at FarmShopMFG.com. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you want, in your life and on your farm, Case IH AFS Connect gives you more control. Monitor your operation, manage your fleet and your farm data, your way. Case IH. Rethink productivity. What's the most accurate way to lay drainage tile? Some say that you should use a laser. Others say GPS works fine. I'll give you some pros and cons in today's Iron Talk. Using a laser to keep an accurate measure of depth has been done for a long time and it works pretty well. With rolling terrain, there are some challenges though. You'll need to move the laser multiple times as you move through the field. Now the other challenge that we've run into on our farm is wind. When the wind is really blowing, it can wiggle your laser, forcing you to stop for the day. GPS signals don't really care about the wind, and you save time as you don't have to move anything around as you're tiling a field. The real question about GPS is, how accurate will that signal be when you're laying tile, especially when you have little, if any, slope to work with in some fields? Well, the answer certainly depends on the quality of the GPS signal that you're working with. When you hear about RTK GPS being accurate within an inch, that refers to side-to-side -to -side accuracy on the soil surface. The vertical accuracy for depth control is commonly believed to be twice as far as the side-to-side -side accuracy. So if your signal gets you within one inch side to side, it may be as much as two inches away up and down. We've laid a lot of tile over the years using RTK GPS guidance. Our experience is that the speed is far greater than laser and the accuracy has been very good. We lay mostly four and six inch tile on our farm and we haven't had flowability problems nor have we suffered from insufficient drainage. There are definitely advantages to using both laser and GPS when installing drainage tile. The decision is up to you which way you go for your farm. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's our time for today, but before we go, we want to invite you to tune in to the Ag PhD radio show. We're on Sirius XM channel 147 each weekday at 2 p.m. Central. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. Yeah.